Well, welcome back. I hope everyone is uh, refreshed, and I'll let you know that uh, we're in the home stretch. So uh, we appreciate uh, your uh, attention and giving us your time this morning. I, I know it's our longest uh, educational event of the year, but it's always been worth it. And I think, uh, again, indeed, this year, uh, it's been an exceptional program. Um, I want to uh, remind everybody that uh, we are going to uh, pull our panel together and uh, we will uh, start to uh, answer your questions that you're submitting in the chat. I'll remind everybody we might not get to every question, uh, but we will try and respond uh, via email uh, at, uh, at a later time uh, if your question did not get answered. Uh, so please uh, now submit your questions through the chat window uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, I want to welcome back our speakers. They're joined by Maureen Gartner, nurse practitioner at the University of Cincinnati uh, Gardner Family Center for Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders. Uh, everybody in our community knows and loves Maureen. Uh, she's been doing this work for... Uh, 10 years now, Maureen, am, am I right? Uh, so, 18. Uh, 18, excuse me. 18. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm obviously working from dated info here. Uh, she also serves as a member of and the medical liaison for the board of directors of Parkinson's Support and Wellness. She serves on several of our uh, PSNW committees. And as I said, she comes in contact uh with just about everybody in, in the community that uh, is involved in Parkinson's. So I want to thank everybody for share, for sticking around for uh, our question and answer session. And actually, I'm going to start with Maureen. And I, Maureen, I just wanted to get your reaction to uh, what you heard today. Well, first of all, with Dr. Dobson's talk, I, I, patients always have questions about cognitive information and how can they deal with it, and the caregivers as well. So I really appreciated all the practical tips that you mentioned, Dr. Dobson. I, I hope everybody kind of took some notes. If not, some of the key features I think they could Google is certainly the MIND diet. And uh, we all preach exercise on a, not even a daily basis, an hourly basis probably. So. I think that um, the take home message there is some, some of the other aspects that you talked about in terms of sleep and a regular routine. And in terms of Dr. Espe and Ben, I, again, having been in the field for 18 years, I think it's really exciting that they are launching into something new. It's probably, um, it's very challenging in the scientific community because it is so new and different. And we all know from history that anytime somebody had a new and different idea, they were kind of scorned for a while. So my hope is that this takes flight and the people that are listening today will soon participate in the CCBP project so that they can help it take flight. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, our first question is for Dr. Dobkin, and uh, it's one that's uh, close to my stomach, uh, <laughs> and, that, and that is, is intermittent fasting helpful in the prevention of dementia? And the reason I say it's uh, near and dear to my stomach is I've got about 55 minutes before I'm allowed to start eating again today. <laughs> um, so that's a great question. Um, I will definitely say that, you know, intermittent fasting is this new and, and trendy topic um, in the field. There are some people that really swear by it and think it could be very helpful. Um, others, not so much. I will say that the research evidence is preliminary and it's mixed. Most of the studies regarding cognitive benefits have been derived from animal models, which may or may not fully generalize um, to humans. That being said, I personally don't love it. Others will disagree. 
Um, but I don't love it for a couple of reasons. You know, in terms of the mechanisms related to um, benefit with intermittent with intermittent fasting, you know, it's been suggested that it may help to decrease neuroinflammation um, and it may help to decrease insulin resistance. While those things may be true, I think there are other ways to also get to that same end goal, um, you know, to decrease neuroinflammation and to decrease insulin resistance. My cons like exercise, for example, does those things. Um, my concern about intermittent fasting is that while it may have some benefits, it also can stress your system. Cortisol levels may increase, and if we're stressing our symptom, if we're stressing our system, that has the opposite of of the intended effect. So, um, you know, certainly, I, I think it's it's out there. Um, some people really like it and they want to try it. Um, I will say again that the evidence is mixed and I would be concerned long term about the stress it could potentially place on your system if you're walking around feeling hungry um, a good part of the time. Okay, I guess that means I can run out and, uh, and grab a sandwich here right away. <laughs> <laughs> and in general, I, I will say I, I am of the of the mindset that it can be really helpful to eat, you know, your, your three meals and two snacks a day in order to keep, um, you know, your, your body fueled and to keep those blood sugar levels stable um, and, and not spiking and crashing throughout the day. Yeah, well, here I am in the last hour of the fast and Dr. Espe is waving around chocolate in front of my face. So, uh, <laughs> all right, well, our next question is for Ben. Uh, ben, we see uh, over, your, uh, over your shoulder there copies of uh, the book Brain Fables. Our question is, uh, where can I get my own copy of Brain Fables? Well, simply enough, I think anywhere, any online bookstore, I think, carries it now. It's certainly available on Amazon. The primary retailer is uh, Cambridge. You can get it at Cambridge University Press's website. Um, I've seen it on Barnes and Nobles and all sorts of other places. So I think anywhere that good books are sold, you'll be able to find it. All right. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Espe. And that question is, how can a patient at UC with Parkinson's uh, be tested for these biomarkers? Well, uh, obviously, uh, the idea is that we are in the exploratory phase of the CCBP study. At the moment, uh, the biomarkers under development are bioassays. They are tests that tell us something about the mechanism of action of therapies that are available for what we call repurposing therapies that we know have a mechanism we know have a, uh, a group of individuals that uh, could benefit and so we are going to be deploying the bioassays that relate to those therapies in those participating in the in the biospecimens of individuals participating <laughs> in this <laughs> So for now, uh, and for probably the next uh, two, three years, the, f the major uh, effort is at the recruitment of uh, as many uh, patients as possible. At, at about that time is when we begin to tease out uh, how many of the individuals there would have the range of bioassay abnormality that would render them candidates. But for now, we don't have those there. So it's sort of a, a phase of uh, building more than a phase of uh, analyzing at the moment. Though we are working already uh, toward getting exactly where we need to be. Uh, this is a long-term project, uh, but we are laser uh, focused on ensuring that this is our decade. Uh, here uh, in Cincinnati, but perhaps in many other places too, we will realize the promise of precision medicine 
my beginning to uh, um, realize successes in the application of molecular therapies to people molecularly suitable to benefit from them. And so I think at this point, what you can do is, is encourage uh, uh, those around you uh, to join the CCBP. And, uh, and our hope is, of course, that we will come to a point where we can answer the question, uh, what appears to be the biological driver of your, your Parkinson's disease, how you are different to others, and how that knowledge allows us to intervene for you in a manner that doesn't necessarily address your symptoms, but it will address your actual disease. It would allow the disease to cease to progress and conceivably, depending on what biological abnormality we might be able to target for you, we might perhaps reverse it. Thanks, Doctor. I actually have a, uh, a bit of a follow-up question on that, and the question was, how is precision medicine different than medicine? Is it based on CRISPR technology and genetic cor correction? Uh, precision medicine as a concept is not based on a given technology. It's based on a concept or a framework whereby medicine is not established to be applicable to a disease, but to people with a disease. Um, one uh, concept, uh, parenthetically, that I learned from Ben uh, that has resonated uh, in terms of appreciating the difference between medicine and precision medicine is that we have come to a point uh, after decades of research where we really know a lot about Parkinson's disease, but very little about people with Parkinson's. Uh, so we have this uh, great model whereby just about every aspect of the cell metabolism in neurons is abnormal. And in fact, uh, there are some uh, graphs that have been created uh, with big data analytics that show how just about every aspect of cell uh, function is affected in Parkinson's disease. Now, how does that translate to people with Parkinson's? We have no idea. So uh, precision medicine is the idea of uh, recognizing that the model of disease we've created for Parkinson's may not apply to anyone. And therefore we need to identify who uh, has what type of Parkinson's and can benefit from which type of therapy. Uh, precision medicine sometimes is being uh, uh, subdivided into ultra precision medicine and that is an understanding that perhaps as uh, we will learn more and more about not just the predominant biological abnormality in an individual but associated abnormalities that we could end up conceiving that uh, when we say Parkinson's, uh, there will likely be a Parkinson's type in as many people living with Parkinson's. So there can be as many Parkinson's diseases as people living with it. Uh, so precision medicine is really the idea that every individual uh, is to be uh, uh, understood for his or her biology and treated accordingly. Uh, there is a related term called uh, 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 personalized medicine. Personalized medicine is not to be confused with precision medicine. Personalization is what we do every day in our clinics. We have people that have more tremor and we try to help with tremor therapies or if they have uh, depression, we use antidepressants. We're personalizing the treatment to the individual's symptoms. Precision is not about personalizing against the symptoms, it's about personalizing for the biology. Uh, and I think the connotation is that you are moving from just simply looking at how individuals look uh, to how individuals are biologically. Thank you, doctor. Uh, this question is for Dr. Dobkin. As an introvert, social interaction often yields anxiety and withdrawal. 
How important is social interaction to addressing cognitive decline? So an, another great question. You know, during my presentation, I reviewed a very comprehensive list of strategies that people can utilize in order to optimize their cognitive health. So while, especially as a psychologist, I believe that social interactions are important and they're therapeutic, you know, I recognize that not everybody desires the same level of social interaction. Um, you know, so that being said, if too much contact with people can cause stress, then I think it's okay to focus on some of the other recommendations that we discussed earlier today. You know, increasing your exercise, um, focusing on making healthy changes with respect to your diet, learning some new stress management techniques like meditation or deep breathing or progressive muscle relaxation, working on your sleep schedule, trying to stay um, ahead of the game with respect to your negative thoughts and talking back to them and crushing them like a bug so they don't get in the way and impede your goals. Um, so going back to this concept of personalized medicine, I think it's important to consider all of the interventions that were put on the table today and then maybe pick one or two places to start and start making changes in the areas that might be easiest to enact meaningful change and start low and go slow um, and build from there. Because there's no cookie cutter approach to enhancing cognitive health or mental health. It's about, you know, again, personalizing what we do to address the symptoms that you have in order to best meet you where you're at. And it's going to look different person to person. It has to look different person to person. Um, in order to be helpful. So um, if being around a lot of people leads to anxiety, there are certainly other ways that you can enhance your cognitive health. Um, that being said, I will also just make a plug um, for therapies that do exist to help individuals deal with social anxiety such that it doesn't have to be um, a barrier to engaging with the day-to-day. -day. I'm not suggesting that that's something that is a requirement, but there are a lot of good talk therapies out there that can help people um, to develop the skills needed to just feel more comfortable around others. But as far as cognitive health goes, pick something else on the list as a starting point. Um, take a new exercise class. Um, listen to a new type of music. Um, go walk in a new park in your neighborhood. Find an audiobook. Um, and those types of changes and interventions can be just as helpful. So find something that you think will stick, that will work with you, um, and continue to maybe layer in one or two new techniques um, every month. And I think that could be a really great recipe for success. Thank you, doctor. Um, next question is, uh, again, for Dr. Espe. I know that you get some of your data digitally. What are you measuring with this data? Have you considered permitting us to use our own technology with Apple Watches and phones to use them instead? You would get more data, and it would be easier for patients. Well, uh, that uh, is an interesting question, but uh, it's also important to realize what we're doing here. Uh, I've mentioned that a key feature of CCBP is that it defines people according to their biology. Now, we clinicians have long suspected without proof that the better we understand our symptoms, uh, the better we will eventually align with the biology that it reflects them uh, that, or that is underlying them. Um, it turns out that uh, that no matter how granular we have become in understanding the way people look, uh, it hasn't ever been corresponding to a specific biology. Uh, and that's why uh, what's referred to as clinical subtyping is not panning out as important to predict in biology. By looking at people, we cannot predict biology. And so why we're collecting data is not the data, uh, by the way, on smartphones, which is considered an extension of that which we can collect in clinic, is not to try to understand Parkinson's better with that data. 
is trying to create dependent variables that we can try to make sense from individuals who are molecularly or biologically homogeneous and that might be important to understand who they are, but not because we think that then eventually we'll be able to then have a smartphone application uh, that based on the data it captures can under can uh, uh, connect us to that source uh, molecular or biological construct. Uh, so that is why I wanted to make sure that uh, part of our work is in recognizing that a lot of what we are doing to uh, understand individuals uh, in the jargon deep phenotyping is not because we think that will give us the answer is because that will give us one of the ways in which we can understand the answer which will come from a completely different source it will come from biological uh, evaluations. Um, big data in and of itself does not mean good data. Uh, there is a whole bunch of big data sets that have been already created from the use of smartphones and detached from the uh, understanding of who those data are from biologically, that data might mislead us into creating the illusion that we are understanding different types of Parkinson's. The types of Parkinson's we need to understand are the types of Parkinson's we can address molecularly slash biologically rather than uh, the kinds of Parkinson's that perhaps can be generated by large data sets, big data that come from the use of smartphones. Now that's a big uh, answer to that question. Uh, in just a much smaller level, the reason we're using uh, an Android device for the uh, portable uh, data collection of data is because the um, underlying algorithms uh, that are in an Android system can then be extracted and analyzed in a variety of different ways. That is not an advantage that we have with uh, the proprietary software that comes from uh, Apple products. Great, thank you, doctor. Uh, so, Dr. Dobkin, back to you. Um, we like our lactose-free, fat-free milk. What's wrong with it? <laughs> um, so, you know what? I am a, a big fan of dairy myself, but I will say I do not eat it nearly as much as I used to. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with your lactose-free milk per se, but what the research suggests is that significant dairy intake over time increases the risk of both um, onset of Parkinson's and may potentially fuel the fire with respect to PD progression. Now, you know, dietary factors are just, you know, one category of factors that are related to, you know, onset and progression of Parkinson's. Um, you know, that being said, it is an area where one can take control. However, there are lots of potential dietary changes that an individual can make in order to optimize their overall health and their cognitive health. So if you really love your milk and you don't feel ready to let it go, well, then maybe that's okay, but we can pick another aspect of our diet to potentially modify. So maybe that means the milk stays, but we bring in more, you know, green leafy vegetables, or we switch from vegetable oil to olive oil. We have, you know, a couple of handfuls of raw almonds as a snack instead of a bag of cookies. So there are other changes that one can make. Again, we're talking about personalized recommendations. So the research does suggest that, you know, dairy is potentially associated with increased risk of Parkinson's um, and increased rates of progression, but it's not the only risk factor out there. If it's not an aspect of your diet that you feel ready or motivated to modify, that's okay. Um, I would pick something else. You know, the idea is there are lots of levers we can pull. Let's pull the lever um, that's going to work for you, and let's pull as many levers to optimize our cognitive health as we reasonably can. Um, I would not expect anybody listening to implement every single strategy and suggestion that I offered, but pick two or three, find what works for you, 
and stick with it. Um, you know, that's the key to behavioral changes and non-pharmacological interventions. It's not enough just to identify the intervention, but we have to implement it and we have to implement it consistently. You know, the analogy I like to use, if you go to your movement disorder specialist and the doctor says to you, oh, you know, in order to get better control over your tremor, we want to increase your total daily dosage of carbidopa levodopa. If you go to the pharmacy and you fill the prescription and you come home and you place that bottle in your medicine cabinet and you just stare at it, but you don't actually take the medication, it's not going to help your tremor. It's not going to help your Parkinson's symptoms. The same philosophy applies to these non-pharmacological recommendations. You know, knowing the information is not enough. It's more important to pick the strategy that you wish to utilize it and then apply it consistently over time. Because if we don't apply it consistently over time, it cannot help us. So if you know that you would never be able to live without milk in your morning coffee, Let's not make that change, but let's pick a few other changes that you can make and that you'd be willing to stick with um, over the long run. Great. Thank you, doctor. Um, uh, we are nearing the end of our, uh, our panel time. Uh, if you have any more questions, I would ask you uh, for the final time, please post those questions uh, in the chat box and uh, I'm going to return to Dr. Espe uh, and then follow up with a question for both Ben and Maureen. Dr. Espe, uh, the question is, is the 23andMe study tied to any particular research program? Uh, the 23andMe organization uh, is uh, not tied to any specific study, but they have made uh, their databases available for data mining to uh, many of those that rec many are, uh, organizations that request uh, to access it. Uh, it also uh, serves as a way to inform patients with specific genetic uh, associations to Parkinson's to consider uh, trials that uh, are or have begun uh, to target individuals with specific uh, genetic mutations associated with Parkinson's disease. So it is a bit of a uh, uh, organization that uh, is uh, providing a bit of an um, umbrella uh, support for genetic subtyping. Uh, and whenever there is a hit uh, that relates to a study, then I think uh, uh, patients can get a notification uh, about their suitability from a genetic perspective for a, for a clinical trial. Now, since I've mentioned uh, that we need to ensure that we're tying interventions to uh, patients with the biological suitability to benefit from them, um, there is still a gap between genetic subtypes and genetic therapies. The genetic therapies that so far are available are not actually targeting the gene directly with very, very few exceptions are intending to change an enzymatic defect that the gene uh, induces. And uh, the question is whether or not that enzymatic defect that we see is uh, sufficiently causal to the individual than one would be expected to do. And there has recently been a demonstration in a uh, GBA cohort, GBA is a specific mutation in Parkinson's, whereby there is a deficiency of GKs, G G glucocerebrosidase is the name of the enzyme. And it appears as if perhaps raising that enzyme might not be enough or it might be perhaps chasing a tail. A gene is the cover of a person's book uh, aging can give rise to many different biological uh, conditions, each of which would have to be treated differently. So far, we're still assuming that one gene equals one disease, and other fields of medicine have uh, uh, suggested, in fact, perhaps confirmed that that isn't the case in most uh, instances. So, um, so be mindful that uh, it, we're moving in a, into a more hopeful era in terms of genetic th therapies, but eventually it'll be clear that we will need more, be, to be more specific than just the gene and be able to understand what is the biology associated with that particular genetic mutation that we currently think is all we need to know about someone's Parkinson's disease. Great. Thank you, doctor. 
Uh, again, I, I mentioned that I have a question that I'm going to pose to both Ben and to Maureen. Maureen, I'll ask you to, uh, to answer first. We say that each Parkinson's case is unique and the treatment should be catered to each. How do we, as a patient, challenge the treatment that's recommended? Well, I think the important thing in the question is that we don't have precision medicine yet. Um, we listen to you, we hear what you say, and we use the tools that we have available today. I constantly try to think outside the box, um, but sometimes we, we only have so many tools in our toolbox. And so the hope is that this research that we've talked about is going to give us specific hammers, specific, you know, screwdrivers, whatever we need for your biological presentation. Great. Thanks. Ben, same question to you. Uh, how do we as a patient challenge, and that word was in quotes, by the way, challenge uh, the treatment recommended? Uh, ben, uh, we're not able to hear you right now. Should be able to hear me now, right? <laughs> yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I would say be very selective, if you can be, about the clinical trials you're enrolling in and about who you choose as your primary neurologist as well. Now. Unfortunately, not everyone has the option, has the ability to choose who they want to give them their own care. But I, I noticed early on in my own journey in this, so the neurologist who diagnosed me is not the neurologist that I continue to see right now, because um, I noticed that the first neurologist wasn't really, really, wasn't really willing to listen to what I had to say. Uh, he was very much in the classical vein, I think, of a lot of medicine, which is very much like a top-down approach where the doctor knows best and he tells the patient what he thinks and what he thinks the patient should do. Um, and in neurology in particular, I think you need to find somebody who need to find a neurologist who's humble enough to understand that in many cases, the patient has a better understanding of the disease that they're experiencing than the neurologist themselves does. Uh, and I think a lot of you are lucky enough to have access to neurologists at UCG and I who, from what everything I've seen in my interactions with all of them, very much embody that humility that I think uh, needs to be in many ways the calling cards of neurology because they, there's, there needs to be that patent recognition that we don't have the tools yet available to help individuals in the way that we need to. So right now the best tool we have is the lived experience of the individual. And if the, if if the neurologist that you're seeing is not willing to listen to you and is just trying to direct you in a ways that you think might not be as to your benefit, try if possible to find a neurologist that can. Excellent advice. Thanks, Ben. Uh, we have reached the end of our uh, panel time. Uh, if we did not get to your question, uh, we at Parkinson Support and Wellness will uh, will try and get that answer for you. Uh, we have your email, so we will send a, a response to you in email on those questions. And again, thanks thanks to the audience for their participation. Uh, I also uh, want to thank our our uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Espe and Dr. Dobkin. Thanks, Maureen and Ben. We are forever grateful for you joining us today and for the leadership and important work that you do with and for our Parkinson community. So uh, again, thank you so much for what was uh, a, a very informative and riveting presentation today. Uh, it's now time to announce the winner of our raffle of the beautiful quilt that was crafted by Rebecca Grappi and Mario Pastura. Rebecca sewed hundreds of face masks for healthcare professionals and first responders about a year ago when face masks were at a premium. She decided to craft a quilt from the swatches that were remaining and then donated that resulting quilt to Parkinson Support and Wellness as a way to help raise funds to support our mission. So many thanks to Rebecca. 
and to her collaborator, Mario, uh, for uh, their help uh, in providing the quilt. I want to thank the Hamor siblings, Car Corey and Luke, for creating the website that showcased our quilt and helped us to sell the raffle tickets. And they helped to select using a random uh, technology-inspired uh, way to pick uh, from the many folks that, uh, that purchased tickets. And it is my pleasure to announce that the winner is Jeff Waltz of Cincinnati. Congratulations, Jeff. We will be in touch with you this week to arrange delivery of the quilt. And thanks to everyone who bought tickets and who continue to support our efforts. You know, last year, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, we were unable to hold our annual fundraiser, Steady Strides 5K Walk and Run, in person. Uh, we moved the event to the fall in an effort to uh, give ourselves more time to be able to get on top of the uh, coronavirus, but we weren't able to uh, eventually have a uh, in-person event. We eventually had a virtual, much like today's uh, event on Halloween. Uh, this year, we're going to, again, hold steady strides in the fall. Uh, and we will offer a virtual participation uh, uh, mode and hopefully the in-person event back at the Linder Family Tennis Center in Mason. We're working with state and local health officials and the tennis center to determine the date and the ability to hold an in-person race. Uh, I'll just ask you to stay tuned via the Parkinson Support and Wellness website, or you can enroll in our mail and email list for further information. I want to thank our exhibitors and in particular our presenting sponsor Adamus and our partner sponsor Supernus uh, for contributing and uh, allowing us uh, to put on this unique event uh, virtually. Uh, we are deeply grateful to them. If you did not uh, get to the sponsor and exhibitor hall today. Uh, please know that we will soon post a recording of today's program on our website at parkinsoncincinnati.org forward slash spring dash forum. You'll be able to, uh, to access the entire program, uh, today's program there at that site. May take about a week or so for us to finish the post-production editing, but I'll invite you to uh, keep an eye on that site. You know, the volunteers at Parkinson Support and Wellness are critical to the success of programs such as today's and the educational programs that we present each month. I want to specifically thank all of the volunteers and in particular our program committee for all of their efforts to uh, underpin the one of the most important uh, pillars of our mission that of learning and education. I also want to thank my, our staff, uh, in particular Nancy, Julia, and Kate, who every day take the steps necessary to turn the plans into action. They are the best. We're grateful to our speakers and presenters and thank them for the time and effort that they make here today and under the technology challenges that we face to provide this virtual experience. And now it's time for us to get to work on next year's program. So I'll end by thanking you for your attention and the great questions you offered. Please let us know your thoughts about the program by reaching out to us at info at parkinsoncincinnati.org. You can visit us at www.parkinsoncincinnati.org to learn more about our mission, the upcoming community events, and how you can join us and participate in our efforts to support the Parkinson community. With that, this concludes this year's Harvey Chayette Spring Forum. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and keep moving. <laughs>